Hi, this is John Horgan. This podcast is an outgrowth of a book I recently wrote called Mind Body Problems. You can read it for free online at mindbodyproblems.com. The book profiles nine mind body thinkers exploring connections between their personal lives and theories. On this podcast, I talk to these and other mind body experts. Today, my guest is economist Deirdre McCloskey, a woman who used to be a man. If you want to respond to our conversation or to my book, email me at jhorgan at highlands.com. And remember, you can find my book for free at mindbodyproblems.com. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, Hi, uh, this is John Horgan. Is that Deirdre McCloskey? Yes, it is, John. How are you? I'm great, Deirdre. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, with me today. Um, I'll, I'll just go through the introductions. I'm John Horgan. I'm a, a veteran science writer and correspondent for um, Meaning of Life TV and Blogging Heads TV. And I recently wrote this book called Mind Body Problems, in which I tried to get to the bottom of what I think is the deepest mystery in science and philosophy and the, the deepest, deepest mystery in general. And the book consisted of nine in-depth portraits of people who I think have wrestled with the mind-body problem from very different perspectives, um, both as professionals, as scientists, philosophers, as a novelist. Um, the scientists come from all different fields, neuroscience, psychology, and economics. And I also wanted people who had wrestled with the mind-body problem on a personal level. And that certainly applies to you. Um, and so you are the uh, penultimate chapter um, of my book, right before the, uh, the epilogue. And um, I spent uh, a weekend with you two years ago, and this is uh, 2016 now, in Chicago. It seems like a long-gone era now. You know, 26, the summer of 2016. And um, so I was hoping that we could talk here and then I could help some of the people out there on the internet get to know you and your work a little better. Okay, I thought I'd start just by reading a description of yourself. This is from your website. You describe yourself as a, a literary, quantitative, postmodern, free market, progressive, Episcopalian, Midwestern woman who was once a man. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, that, uh, that covers a lot of ground. I want to, I guess I, I have to start with the story of, um, of your private, uh, crossing. Um, your, your decision uh, to become a woman when you're in your 50s before we get to your economics. And, um, and I wonder if you could uh, start by telling us, uh, I, I don't know if, how, if you could tell it briefly, but try to tell it, give us the basic story of, of this great transition in your life. No, it, 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 it's, it was not private. It was very public. Mm-hmm. So you can't change, as I explained to my wife of 30 years, you can't change gender in private. Yeah. Stay in private or you know, be something else in private, but you can't present as a woman in private. From the age of 11, I would go to sleep praying that the next day I would, be, uh, I would not stutter because I, when I was a child, I, 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 I stuttered very badly, and that I would be a girl. And at age 53, as, an, as a new Episcopalian, I got half of my prayer. So I think that's not so bad. Maybe if I'd become a Catholic, I would have gotten both. So I, I'm, um, I was married to the, to the love of my life for many years. I have two grown children, three grandchildren. And so far as my relationship with my wife was concerned, I was perfectly normal. We had a very happy marriage in most ways. But in that last year, I realized 
that I could do what I wanted to do at 11. Now, I was born in 1942, so it is 1953. And I tell you, there was nothing to be done. If you were gay in 53, you were in bad doo-doo. But if you were transgender in 1953, yeah, for hopeless. So I, um, I, I realized on the day in August 1995 that I could and would change. And what's odd about it, it's now been um, 22 years, is that I didn't, after that day, ever have the slightest doubt. And this is unusual. You know, you choose your occupation or your spouse or whatever, and you always have those four in the morning doubts. But I'm, I'm kind of amazed that I don't have any of those. So that, then I've, you know, it's been happily ever after. The only, the only fly in the ointment has been that my marriage family turned against me. My former wife, whom I still love, and my two children haven't spoken to me since then. But my, but my birth family came around, and I have colleagues and friends, and I have a very uh, fulfilled life. If I, I always say that if, I, if I'm about to be hit by a bus, I see it coming, and as the wheels roll over, I'll say, well, dear, you've had a pretty good run. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what, one of the things that you could have added optimist or, um, I don't know, somebody with a, with a happy outlook on life to that list of descriptions of yourself. I think so too. I am an optimist. My 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 sister, whom I love very much, um, is is a pessimist. <clears throat> we argue about not argue. We 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 amusingly debate who is the youngest daughter of my mother. <laughs> She's eleven years chronologically younger than I am, but I haven't been a, a woman very long for twenty two years. So who's the youngest? <laughs> so. Um... Your crossing wasn't easy, and you just mentioned your sister. Yeah. And, um, I know that she was really opposed to it. Um, she thought it was crazy. Can you, so can you tell us a little bit about... Yeah, she was, she's a psychologist, an academic psychologist with a PhD in psychology, and she, she thought that I had gone nuts. Now, you know, I'm the only person here or of any, any of your listeners who's been certified sane four times. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, you're all the rest, all the people I meet are complete loonies, and I'm the only sane one. But I've been, geez, she chased me around for a, a while, about six months, uh, to stop me from doing it um, on the grounds that uh, it, it, it was not. Uh, I don't know how she would describe it now, a sincere wish that it because I was crazy. But, it, but we're on very good terms now. It, 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 it took a number of years. Mm -hmm. But she had me, she tried four times to have me incarcerated in, in a, in, for, for psychiatric problems. And two of the times she succeeded. That is, she got the cops to send me off to the, to, to, to the psychiatric, locked psychiatric ward, yeah. observation. But in both cases, because I was middle class and had some money, I was able to hire lawyers to get me out the next day, which is somewhat unusual in this case, in these cases. So, you know, it was, <laughs> it made my book called Crossing, published in 1999, more interesting. Because if, if all of it happened is, I decided to cross, uh, I did it. Um, I'm fine. Would have been a really boring book. Right. <laughs> Full of the book is made really tense because Laura, my 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 beloved sister, is chasing me around with psychiatrists in tow. So it worked out okay, but it was it was an experience that every middle class person ought to have. Being jailed, actually, jail is a little better because then you know you're going to get out. But a psychiatric ward, you don't know if you're you're, you're going to get out. Right. What I found remarkable about your story is that, you know, it's hard enough to go through an identity crisis of any kind. Yeah. 
your identity crisis uh, made you bump up against um, economic limitations. You know, can you afford to get the surgery? Uh, the limits of medicine are the phys- are the doctors are the surgeons capable of, of performing the surgery safely? Oh, yeah. My voice, my 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 the, the one of the best vocal surgeons in the United States, a doctor in Philadelphia, assured me that he could modify my vocal cords. Mm-hmm. Had a female voice, and you know surgeons have to be confident. Yes. You know, they, they have to do it. If they, if they have to do it, they have to do it immediately. But he was wrong. He was unable to do it. So I, I, was, I have the voice I have. My, my explanation is that I drank a quart of whiskey and smoked 40 cigarettes every day for 50 years. And this is the voice you get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned your humor, don't change gender. <laughs> You, I, I just wanted to say, I, was, I, I meant to say it before and I forgot, so I'll say it right now. Your memoir, Crossing, is one of the uh, most surprising, fascinating, uh, wonderfully written um, pieces of literature related to gender, to the mysteries of sex that I've ever read. It's really quite extraordinary, and I urge everybody out there to to uh, check it out. Well, it's, it's going to be coming out in a, a, a 20th anniversary edition sometime in the coming year, I think, in, the, in 2019. And it's got a small postscript at the end of my, how things have gone since 19, uh, since I published the book first, which was to, um, 1999. That's great, and, and it seems as relevant as ever. I, I, I just wanted to point out that it's it's not only the limits of medicine. You were also up against um, attitudes in psychiatry, which you already, you know. So you, by definition, are nuts just because you're a biological man who wants to become a woman, and that was defined as a disorder. Well, in fact, the interesting sidelight on that is that I described that day that I mentioned when I. I realized that I could and should do it in August of 95. I called it to a journalist who was discussing it with me, an epiphany. Now, epiphany is a religious word. It turned out that in the psychiatry of that time, and I think it's probably still true, religious experiences are considered evidence of insanity too. So, so um, you know, I had a I had it both ways. The, the psychiatrist didn't, at the time, really understand uh, transsexuality, so-called, at all. And then added to that was this um, unfortunate use of a, of a religious metaphor. A couple of years later, I became a Christian. I became an Episcopalian. So there, there's a connection between the two, but it's not that I was seeing Jesus in a tree or something like that. <laughs> well, then here's another, another dimension of your transition is political. You yeah. know, there's the politics of gender, which are very, uh, which are very much in the news lately, and the politics of being, uh, being tr- transgender. Did you think of yourself as a pioneer, as somebody who's, who's sort of uh, finding a path that others can more easily follow after you? Not too much, because there have been much more courageous pioneers. Um, Lynn Conway and uh, um, Jan Morris, they had done it back in the 70s. Right. I was in the 90s. Now, it was unusual then. It wasn't, wasn't it, I mean, my God, in the last five years, it's become, you know, uh, uh, it's become sort of boring. You, know, you admit to someone that you're transgender, and they say, "Oh, gee, yeah, that's great. How about the ox? <laughs> How about the ox?" And and so um, I, I I didn't feel like a pioneer, but in a way I was because I was an academic, and that and it hadn't been usual for 
actually, academic life is a good place to do it. So is the theater and, and entertainment. Um, Cher's uh, son, for example, is an, ex is an example of this <laughs> going the other way. Yeah. You know, very interestingly, what I've learned in the last five years is that it's about equal female to male and male to female. Uh huh. Worldwide. Um, I'm curious about, you know, so there's been a lot of discussion lately about um, whether science or what science is saying about differences between the male and female psyche. Yeah. And it seems to me that you're a particularly um, important person to consult on these matters because you've been on both sides of the, of the gender divide. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are. Do you think that there is kind of a, a female psyche and a male psyche and that this should play out in, in I don't know, the kinds of jobs that we have, uh, for example, in various ways? Well, you know, I, I'm a first wave, uh, first wave uh, um, feminist. I believe that women and men should be allowed to do what they want to do harmlessly. Right. I don't, don't hurt, physically hurt other people. If they offend other people, well, that's just too bad. You get used to it. But if, if they hurt other people, that's not a matter. So, um, but, I, and I'm inside the experiment, right? Yeah. Just point out. But I don't know, I don't, it's very confusing. I, I started taking female hormones, which I only took for a few years because I was 53 when I started this. So you can think of me as a post-menopausal -me uh, uh, woman. Um, but the hormones were very powerful. I started to cry at movies a month after Into the Hormones, for example. So they're powerful. And by the way, they're especially powerful female to male. Mm -hmm. I've had some friends who have gone that way. And it's quite startling how powerful the hormones are that way. And then there are the, uh, the, the social expectations. And those are, you have to do gender correctly if you want to be seen as a woman. Yeah. You're, you're not trying to fool people. You're just trying to have a peaceful life. So when you walk down the street, people don't say, oh, there's a man in the dress. These are my cheekbones. I paid for them. <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> so your face gets checked a lot, and then your your your, your general demeanor, your your um, in conversation and in um, walking and so forth, you have to kind of work on that. So there's kind of an acting job, but then this is kind of the kind of thing that that the girls, born girls, learn from the beginning. But then there is also, as you're suggesting, a deep internal feeling. Um, some people, a lot of people, decide when they're two years old that they're the opposite gender to the one they were assigned at birth. It's not very common, but it happens. Mine, as I told you, did wait until age 11. But as a boy, I was a somewhat gentle boy. I wasn't effeminate, but I was gentle mm -hmm. and sweet <laughs> in, in a social way. So, you know, I, here, I'm inside the experiment, and I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell how much it's genes, how much it's social expectations, how much, how much, how much, I don't know. But you, I, I was going to say, you, you also you played contact sports. You, you were on your football team, I think, in high school. And I was, uh, I was the captain of my, high, my, my, I have to admit, my very small boys' school. It was, had a very small football team. Right. I was the captain. And you said that also, as a, as a young economist, you were quite aggressive, right? I was, I was, I was at, at, um, at the University of Chicago for 12 years. It's where I taught my first job. And you have to be really tough at Chicago, especially in those days, or you don't get a word in edgewise. So I was tough. And, you know, I'd take down people and act like academic life was sort of a hockey game. Um, and I've become, you know, who knows? Is it because I grew up, because I'm older, or because I changed gender? But in any case, I'm more um, 
is he going now? But, you know, if you if you provoke me, I'm pretty tough. And I, this would be true of my mother. She's the same way. She's not. She's she's fairly tough. And I know some other economists. I'm thinking of a, of someone named Barbara Bergman, who's about ten years older than me and went to Harvard. Uh, as I did for graduate school. And 10 years earlier, I went to graduate school in the mid-60s, she in the early 50s. And as a woman, with her aggressiveness in the early 50s, no one liked it. The professors didn't like it. Whereas a guy in the mid-60s, I was aggressive. They said, oh, Donald, that was my name. Oh, Donald, you're great. Oh, boy, wonderful. And, you know, that... (laughs) That's changing in the world, thank God. One, another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, that we talked about a little in Chicago was that there are some feminists who are, um, who are not so friendly, who have been critical of, uh, of transsexuals, of men who have become women. I, I just wonder if you can explain, help us understand what's going on there. A little hard because I don't quite. The extreme case is Jermaine Greer, an Australian, um, kind of an academic, although not much on that score, but a, a figure in se- second wave, um, second wave feminism. She's an Australian who spent her, her career in Britain, and she's really hostile to. Trans, trans women, if you want to use that phrase. And then there's the women's, the, the Michigan Women's Music Festival, which f- for years um, had big dykes going around investigating people to make sure they weren't XY people, that is, people born men, and throwing them out if they were. Huh. And that, you know, that was just so against the kind of gender freedom that first wave feminism is about, which is about equality of opportunity. Yeah. I, I am a liberal in that fundamental sense that I believe you should leave people alone if you, if, if, if you have a chance. There's all this kind of silly stuff that trans women will sneak into ladies' rooms. You know, okay, sneak in. You got to pee. See, and imagine going into a lady's room, me going into a, sorry, sorry, into a men's room. It'd be a disaster. So it, it's completely crazy. They say they're going to sneak in and rape women. I mean, come on. Give me a break. This is a hard, it, it's like wanting to be a lawyer <laughs> or wanting to be Canadian. You, know, you just do it. And let's not make a big deal of it. This is human choice. It's freedom of choice. It's not a conspiracy against born women. And, and anyway, that kind of essentialism, which Germaine Greer and others espouse, is really against the idea of equality and freedom of choice. Mm-hmm. Well, this is one of the things that I, I really loved about, I love about your, your work. First of all, about your, your, um, your personal life, and its intersection with your professional outlook is that in both cases, you're emphasizing freedom and it's sort of against essentialism. And you're saying that, uh, you know, we should have as many choices as possible to explore different, different ways of life. And I've, I've now written in the last, uh, I don't know what, 50 to 12 years or so, I've written three books, a trilogy, called The Bourgeois Era, published by the University of Chicago Press, which makes this point uh, pretty vividly in a, in a historical context and with the economics and the sociology and, 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 and literature and so forth, making the point that freedom made us rich and reasonably good. Um, and, and I think that's the key to the modern world, is getting away from the determinism of hierarchy. I mean, speaking of the mind-body problem, if, if you're frozen 
in the job of a milkmaid. And you can't get out of it because, come on, dear, you are physically a milkmaid. It's, it's, it's not freedom, obviously. And it's not allowing you to dream beyond being a, beyond being a milkmaid or even taking the milkmaid <laughs> assignment at all seriously. It's all very mechanical. Mm -hmm. And as I said, deterministic. And that started to break down in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And famously, the slave owner said, all men are created equal. And, and that, that idea, which was very much in the air among advanced intellectuals in Northwestern Europe in the, in the, in the 1700s, has just bloomed, slowly but bloomed, flowered is perhaps the better word, in the, in the next 200 years. And then one after another, poor men, slaves, women, immigrants, people of color, colonial people, gays, and even transgender people have been allowed, as the English express it, to have a go. Right. That's been, that's been a source of tremendous creative um, uh, power in our culture, and that's spread to the whole world. What about, and so you see capitalism as a natural expression of liberalism? So your, your view, uh, talk about the great enrichment a little bit. As, uh, as I understand it, you see it as something that is, is emerging out of liberalism, but then is also very closely tied to, to capitalism. Yeah, but, but, you know, I don't like the word capitalism. I think right. it's a very misleading word because it suggests to everyone, even the blessed Adam Smith and to Karl Marx and, and to modern economists, that the key to, to becoming rich is piling up capital. Right. Or brick on brick or bachelor's degree on bachelor's degree. And that's not true because what you need, of course you need the bricks and the bachelor's degree, but what you really need is a bunch of new ideas. Mm. So it's, uh, it's in the context of mind, speaking of mind and body, it's in the, it's in the realm of mind that the great enrichment took place. Mm -hmm. Well, the amazing number of uh, innovations, mechanical, biological, but then also uh, institu institutional that we've had in the last couple of centuries. It's just amazing. And it's made us very rich. And, that, and it bids fair to make the entire world rich. Now China and India are following and lots of other countries. And as the great Hans Rosling, the uh, Swedish professor of public health, has pointed out forcefully, things are really getting better worldwide. There are very few exceptions to this. So, but it was... Um, it was indeed this matter of freedom, this matter of, of uh, letting people have a go that, in, in, the, in the root sense, inspirited people. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I can, you know, I can come as my Irish and Norwegian ancestors came to the New World and have a farm and invent this, that, and the other thing, S start a business, start a hairdressing salon or something. And all that made for this tremendous explosion of innovation. When did you arrive at that view? My slowly, slowly. I mean, I'm a slow thinker. I'm not very fast at all. I, in the 90s, I would have said that my purpose of this book that I was planning to do was to defend, well, capitalism. But in the 2000s, as I worked on the first book, which was about the ethics of, of, of business called The Bourgeois Virtues, I realized that I was approaching or I was, I was seeing um, an answer to the question that the blessed Adam Smith asked, what was the nature and causes of the wealth of nations? And I, and I saw that this, this liberalism, this um, new attitude towards the middle class, towards innovators in particular, and entrepreneurs, was the real gasoline, the real fuel of our 
enrichment. And that's what the next two books in the trilogy seek to prove, or prove to be false, but I, I think it is true. So it, it, it changed around, and then, and then I also realized, I think around 2005, that something I had studied much earlier, namely rhetoric, persuasion, how people change their minds in science, for example, economics or mathematics, what that has to do with all this. And I saw that it was words, it was products of our minds, of our highly verbally constructed human minds that changed in the 1700s. And um, when it happens, it makes for great innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, when, so your focus on rhetoric yeah. and, and words, is this why you call yourself a postmodernist? Yes. Are you saying that our knowledge is always um, sort of constructed rather than discovered, especially in the social side? That's what I think of it as a sort of essence of postmodernism. Also in the physical and biological sciences. Obviously, there are facts of the world. I'm not denying that. There are facts of the social world, too. Mm -hmm. um, the questions we ask of them are human questions. The great Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, 1920s, 30s, and 40s, said once, physics is not about the world. It's about what we humans can say about the world. Yeah. That doesn't make, that doesn't make it arbitrary and say whatever you want, uh, up is down. No, no. But it, it does say that, that the questions we ask about the economy or literature or philosophy or physics, chemistry, biology, geology, those ways, you know, it's our human interests, so to speak, our, our curiosities and the particular pattern of our curiosities. As you know, in, in, in physics, especially engineering, the, the assumption is, the deep faith is, that the world is mathematically structured. Mm -hmm. and, that, that, and that's what they say all the time. And, and it proved to be a very good idea of Galileo and Newton especially. Um, but it's a, it's a way of asking questions. By contrast, Darwin, and in particular, you know, well, evolution, is not the same kind of question asking. It's asking, what's the story? Yeah. The physicists are asking, what's the metaphor, the analogy, in particular the mathematical metaphor? So there, there's a deep sense in which, um, and it, again, it's not, it's not touchy-feely. It's there, serious science. Here, here's one, one way of expressing that, that brings the politics and the science close together. There are only two ways of changing people's minds or their actions, let's put it that way. Either you can hold up a gun to their head and say, do what I say, and then they say, oh yeah, you bet, you bet I'll do it. Or, as in this me metaphor that I think most languages have, we change their mind. And the only way you change people's mind is by it can be bad, bad persuasion, like the persuasion in, in, in fascism and in, in, in racism, or it can be good persuasion. So I, I think the conversation of humankind is what we do, it's what we do in science, it's what we do in art. Well, you know, what I like about your version of postmodernism is that I mean, I, I always considered myself a scientific realist, but I think I'm becoming more of a, a postmodernist as I get older. Um, and what I like about it, I think, is that it it encourages a certain modesty and and humility, especially um, in proportion to the importance of the question. So, especially, I think we really need to be modest um, in our claims when we're talking about human nature, I agree. when we're talking about what we are 
and uh, about how we should live our lives and you know what constitutes a good life and all these really deep questions that go back thousands of years yeah. and this is the, i find that view of yours and and tell me if i'm overreaching here quite compatible with the view that i'm trying to present in my book which was that we should just give up the idea that there is a single universal answer to the question of what we really are, of what it means to be human, and, and realize that all we have is all these stories. Some stories are better than others, but um, the multiplicity of stories is a wonderful thing. Of course it is. And, and it's, it's not un, un, unscientific um, in the sense that it's not, it's not that it's not serious. Uh, the, not just myths. But, but the stories we t tell about each other psychologically and, and, uh, and, and so on are crucial to our lives and, are not, and have a b big impact. I just heard a speech by Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist at NYU. And John um, is into a kind of therapy, I forget the jargon for it, where what you do is, you watch the little stories you're telling yourself and try to try to correct try to get better stories so if you have a story as a story of i always fail i never do anything right he says that's not going to be good for you <laughs> that's going to make you very unhappy and incompetent if you keep saying oh i'm incompetent i can't do anything no watch yourself telling it that story that and and check it for reality. Now there's a possibility that you are incompetent. <laughs> a a realist position is to say, well, I'm not too competent at tennis. Maybe I'm not, you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. Or I am pretty good at tennis. And so it's a sort of as Freud said, it's the reality principle, but it's not. But the but as you said, the problem with fierce scientific or social scientific realism it applies to literature too, to the study of it, is that the person saying that I'm a realist has this pose of I'm bringing news from reality, and you people ought to shut up. Right. It's just kind of dumb. It's 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 almost um, immature. Yeah, you know, someone like Einstein, um, all his life had this curiosity and this modesty, this humility before the fact. As Newton famously said, "I am merely a child walking by the seashore, picking up an occasional pebble of knowledge." And I, you know, <laughs> I'd like to see more scientists like that. My my hero in in, in physics is Feynman, Richard Feynman, who had very much this attitude. Um, so I I want to go back to capitalism. So, what worries you about capitalism? Uh, first of all, let me let me ask you about Marx. Um, What's your relationship with Marx? Well, he was the hero of my youth. Huh. I was a Marxist. The, the old joke is, if you're not a Marxist by age 16, you have no heart. If you're still a Marxist when you're 26, you have no brain. <laughs> and I just made it in both cases. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 you know, I think that Marx was the greatest social scientist of the, of the 1800s without compare. And I say that to my right-wing friends, and they get angry. And then I turn and say to my left-wing friends, of whom I have met, I say, and he was wrong about almost everything. And they get angry. That's why I have no friends. <laughs> um, no, I, I think Marx was a great thinker, but, high, but, but mistaken in all kinds of crap. And although, you know, he had an admiration for what we're agreeing for the moment to call capitalism. I would rather call it innovism. Okay. Heart is, let, let's, let's, we can call it whichever you want. But, um, he understood the power of innovism 
more than, say, John Stuart Mill, a contemporary of his, who was a great economist. But um, he thought it was doomed. He thought it would inevitably lead to socialism, and I think he's wrong. Almost of the opinion that innovism is the world's future and will save, save the wretched of the earth and already has. In our Okay, I, I, I have to, I can't use innovism because I have these two friends. Uh, these are uh, science and technology uh, historians who have been ranting about how much they hate innovation having become a buzzword over the, for, they've been saying this for a couple of years. And, and so I just, I, I'm sorry, I can't use that term. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with, uh, with capitalism. Okay, fair enough, but, but understand it's misleading. Okay. Um, the, the way I teach Marx to my students, to, you know, I, I teach it to freshmen, uh, yeah. is that he was a great critic, uh, yeah. a great diagnoser of some of the internal contradictions of capitalism, uh, but, uh, but that he was lousy as, as uh, somebody prescribing a solution. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think either. I, I think the second is correct. I think the first is wrong. I don't think it's his diagnosis is correct. In fact, a great Marxist economist, Joan Robinson at Cambridge University, once said she was a Marxist. She thought Marx was a great and followed Marx in a lot of ways. She said, look, Marx says correctly that there's a tremendous amount of innovation uh, going on under because of this uh, so-called capitalism. And then he also says the poor will become miserized, the workers, and the rate of profit for the capitalists will fall. So both of them will be screwed. <laughs> now, wait a second. You can't have all three of those. Right. If you've got innovation, it's got to go somewhere. The reward for it, it doesn't go to Mars. It's got to go to some person, either a worker or a capitalist. And in the event, what actually happened in capitalism is that the rewards massively went to the working class. See, it's, it's crucial to remember or to understand this great enrichment, to understand how big it was. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you don't get the science right. And here's how, how big it was. A factor of 30 in real income per head from 1800 to now. Factor of 30. <laughs> yeah. That's deadly. That's not just 100%, which had happened before in human history from time to time. And then it, people would kind of slump back into 2 or $3 a day. It's $130 a day. It's a tremendous increase, completely unprecedented. It's 3,000%, not 100%. And <laughs> so the, the worries like... Uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist who worried about, worries about inequality, seemed to be kind of silly beside this enormous improvement of the welfare of the poorest people among us. They have work, roofs over their head and ample food and access to medical care that were inconceivable in 1800. But are still, will you grant that they are still poor? Insufficient? Um, Absolutely. I, I'm not saying that there's nothing to be done to help the poor, although the kind of things I want to say, I think the things that help the poor most is, um, is, is freedom. And I look at the west side of Chicago, which is a free fire zone, and one, one thing you could do, the first thing you could do, is to stop the war on drugs tomorrow. Uh. And the free fire part of it would disappear. The second thing you could do is declare the west side of Chicago an enterprise zone, such as they've used in China and lots of other places around the world, to let people do stuff, hire people voluntarily, no slaves, um, to work at, at the wage that they agree on. And the west side of Chicago would become again, as it was, um, 80 years ago, a hive of industrial activity. Now it's 
I mean, there are whole blocks where there are no houses. It's a disaster. So, yeah, I want to help the poor. That's my whole purpose in life. That's why I got into economics. You, uh, so I've, I've met some, I don't know, libertarian or I, I don't know the correct term. So oh, yes, it's the correct term, John. Liber Real liberal. Liberal. Liberal in the 19th century sense. And that's what I am. I'm not, you know, I don't like the word libertarian because it, it, it's associated with people who say, oh, screw the poor. Right. Are losers. And that is absolutely not my, I call myself a, a Christian liberal, or if you want, a Christian libertarian. I acknowledge an obligation to, uh, obligation to the poor. And not just uh, only if I pay them to clean my, my toilets or something. I want them to prosper. Right. If my people were poor. Yours were poor. We're, we're, both of our people are from Ireland. And, you know, come on. They, they, Ireland, by the way, is a good example of this. Ireland, when I first saw it in 1967, was a third world country. Mm -hmm. And now income per head in Ireland is equal or higher to what it is in the United States. It's amazing. I, you know, I actually saw Ireland in 1967 as well. When I was uh, when I was just a kid, I was 14 years old. Yeah. And I went back in the mid 90s, and I was amazed at it was like a completely different country. It's incredible. Um, I so what are you worried about now? Uh, well, let me just go through some of the big ones. Let, let's start with climate change. Obviously, yeah. What what should we do? I, I I'm not concerned about glo global warming in particular, but I want us to handle it sensibly and not get panicked right now. I think it's disgraceful the way the Trump administration has behaved. But on the other hand, I don't want to hand over policy to Al Gore. Because Al, uh, actually, he had an interesting conversation with this person I mentioned, this Hans Rosling from Sweden. And Gore said to Hans, we have to exaggerate in order to change the politics. And Rosling said, no, I'm not willing to do that. I'll tell the truth about global warming, but I won't exaggerate in order to change the politics. And th th that's kind of my attitude. I want to be sensible about it. So I think we've got to, well, one thing we've got to do is devise me methods and work on it of, of carbon capture. That, that's, I think, we might, that might be one way to do it. And, the, and move to natural gas and away from coal. It's disgraceful to say it again that the Trump administration claims to the miners of West Virginia that coal is going to come back. It's not going to come back. And take another unpopular position I take, which is that um, we should be doing more with safe nuclear power. It is safe. The French have figured out how to generate electricity safely with nuclear power, and they take care of the waste. We can do the same. You know, a lot of environmentalists agree with you on that. That's a, uh, that's a big debate within the environmental movement. You know, it's where the, and, and it's you know, nuclear power. So, you know, people get it all confused. They're, they worry about the bomb. They say, oh, look, look, look at Fukushima. Look at, look, at all, look at all the terrible things that can happen. And they don't realize that other forms of energy um, cost lives more than these occasional screw-ups in atomic energy. They, they have the bomb in mind, and that really distorts their thinking. So since we're talking about uh, the bomb and weapons, some of um, some of my pacifist friends think that we will never solve the problem of war and militarism as long as we have capitalism. They see free enterprise as completely tied in with the war machine. I wonder if you can just comment on that. Well, I think it's the opposite. I think it's clearly the opposite. Um, uh, it, it was once said, and I don't think it's worked out quite this way, but it's once said, and it's a pretty good 
that every country that has, that countries that have McDonald's can't go to war with each other. Right. And, and, it's, it, and, and you can see where that's coming from. You know, this is the old claim in the First World War that the merchants of death caused the war. Well, that's baloney. I mean, they may or may not have made a lot of money from the war, but they didn't cause it. And, and, and the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us against is the result of big government, of, uh, of, uh, of militarism. It's not a, not a result of capitalism. Mm-hmm. You, you, a capitalist economy can make just as much uh, selling copies of the Bible as uh, selling, or the Quran, uh, as, as selling bombs. So that's just a crazy left. You know, I had a debate last uh, summer with Noam Chomsky. Oh, great. Chief theorist of this very, and now he's very old, and, and we, were, we were treating him very respectfully, as we should, because he's, he, he's, he's a major scientist in, in linguistics. But it's, he's, he's got this kind of view that capitalism causes war and this is just complete nonsense well capitalism certainly takes advantage of um it takes advantage of what's there yeah big government which you can influence and get contracts to build roads or to build bombs surprise surprise the road building firms and lockheed and so on are going to take advantage of it. Well, why shouldn't they? Um, if, if we're going to build bombs, we ought to build them efficiently. Right. <laughs> so if we're going to build roads, we ought to build them efficiently. So, and, and, the, um, and, and capitalism, more or less, if it's real capitalism and not crony capitalism, which is a very different matter, it's real capitalism, then they're forced to produce their bombs or roads at <laughs> at a cheap price. So I, I don't think there's anything about capitalism in particular that leads to a, uh, a military society. In fact, rather the contrary. It's socialism. It's big government that leads to war. I mean, after all, there, there's, it's not an accident that Hitler's Germany was called National Socialism. It was a combination of the two worst ideas that the intellectuals have had in the last couple of centuries. Nationalism, aggressive, stupid nationalism of the sort that Trump represents, and socialism of the stupid sort that Bernie Sanders represents. You combine those two, and that's Hitler. Um, I, we're, I, can, I know that what you just said is, I can see the comments already on Blogging Heads TV. That's I'm great. sure they're going to be outraged, but they're wrong. How about that? <laughs> so how optimistic are you? You know, I wrote this book called The End of War, which went Good. nowhere. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's, if it was read at all, it was, it was widely dismissed as a, a very naive hope. I just wonder how confident you are. It's a very good book. I'm telling you, I've, I've read it and it's damn good. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, absolutely. You're correct about it, John. They, in fact, you and um, who's the guy at Harvard who does the popular books, uh, the psychologist, um, he says that, that things are improving. Yeah. Oh, Steve Pinker. Yeah, Steve Pinker. But then there's, then again, this guy, Ross, I mentioned, and me, and uh, uh, Jonathan Height. Now, Jonathan Height's a little bit different, but we all say, Contrary to what seems to sell, which is pessimism, if you say that not only is there no end of war, but it's going to get worse, then you'll sell a million books. People seem to like to hear that the world is coming to an end. And I wish they had more sense, because in the last two centuries, it shall, yeah, with the exception of maybe the Second World War, <laughs> it, it hasn't shown any signs of coming to an end. What about... It seems to me that a, a wild card, if you're looking into the future, is science and technology, especially insofar as they give us the power to change ourselves. Uh, 
a lot of neuroscience right now is funded by the Defense Department. And mm -hmm. it's aimed at possibly enhancing soldiers, giving them new powers. You've heard about the autonomous weapons and killer robots and all that stuff. I just wonder how you think about, about uh, that aspect of innovation. Well, it's a bad aspect of it. You know, interestingly, in the 1950s, a lot of economics was financed by the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. Game theory in particular, which was viewed by, by, by the Navy, especially, as something that they needed to know to outwit um, s s um, Soviet submarines, that sort of thing, and to uh, control the... Uh, the, the arms race. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's unfortunate when it comes out of, uh, out of the weapons of war, but I'm very optimistic about artificial intelligence and robots and so on. The basic point is, and I think you'll agree with me, all technology since the beginning of time, at least of human time, has been artificial intelligence applied to robots. Let's take the bow and arrow is a simple example. You had spears. You'd throw the spears, and they wouldn't go very far, and they weren't too accurate. And then you invented the bow and arrow, which is a machine for thinking <laughs> about where the, where the thing's going to go. Instead of you as a human having to aim it, you, you aim it in this much easier way and let the string go, and bang, it goes right to the place you intended. So you get the longbow archers of Agincourt and so forth, or the, uh, or, or the Mongols shooting compound bows on horseback like, like uh, Hollywood Indians. Anyway, the, the, um, I, I, every thing that increases the power of humans is a robot, a show a robot. A car is a robot. God, a computer is a robot. Thank God I don't have to, I, I learned to type on a, my father's mechanical underwood, and now I just touch my keys and it's much better. Right. <laughs> so, so I don't have this fear that is inspired by a lot of robot talk. For example, technological unemployment is a complete myth. It's never happened. It's never happened ever in the history of man, humankind, and it's not going to happen. It, it, the actual truth is that about 15% of all jobs disappear every year and have forever in the United States. Huh? Stream cases, farmers. In 1800, over 80% of Americans were on farms. Now it's 1%. So we find new jobs, we move to other things, and we're in you. Um, so I have to ask you about our current political situation. The election hadn't happened yet when we spoke two years ago, um, although you alluded to Trump a couple of times. Um, I wonder just what you think about the what are being described as anti-democratic trends, both here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Does that worry you? Well, yeah. Uh, this populism. I was in Hungary a couple of weeks before its last terrible election, when this character Orban was resoundingly reelected. And he calls himself an illiberal uh, um, Democrat, which is to say that he wants to go with the majority opinion and to heck with the minorities. And it was such a shocking campaign. It was explicitly anti-Semitic. In a country that only a large country, about 11 million people, with 40,000 Jews attacking of the Jews and the Muslims. The Muslim um, refugees from Syria who wanted to come through Hungary to get to Germany, he, he demonized them. Oh my, just 
exactly the way that Trump is right now demonizing this four or 5,000 uh, caravan coming from Central America. He's going to make a big deal of that. And it's shameful. These people, these poor people are, are frightened and, and starving. And according to our laws, the laws of the United States, we should be treating them as refugees. It, and it's, we've agreed to this law. We've had this law for 50 years as a result of the horrors of the Second World War. And he says, oh, no, we're obeying the law. No, they're not. They're violating habeas corpus. They're separating toddlers from their mothers at the border. This is hideous. But, but I don't think in the long run it's populism that's the danger, although right now it's all over the place. The Philippines, uh, Russia, Turkey, blah, 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 they're all a bunch of fascist populists. But the real problem, in my view, against liberalism is the longer and slower criticism from the right, from conservatives, since, since uh, um, really the early 19th century, early 1800s, and from the left, from socialism, from the middle of the 1800s on. Those two things are both criticisms of a liberal economy hmm. and democracy, and I'm against them. I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal. I keep putting my hand up there. It looks very big on the screen. Look. <laughs> very dramatic. Um, <laughs> all right. I, I, be, careful, be careful. Be careful. We've been uh, we've been talking for almost an hour now, so it's uh, it's time to wrap it up pretty soon. I wanted to ask you about religion again. Mm -hmm. um, I find it fascinating that you are a uh, a Christian and. I I wonder if you can you can just say why you know this is also something that happened to you pretty late in life uh, yeah. after you decided to become uh, become a woman. So why and, and and if if you can describe your faith also that would be great. the why is probably no more sensible than it is for gender. You know, people would say why did you change to be a woman? Was it for career? Well. <laughs> The United States at this time is not a career move. And, uh, or are you being fashionable? And, uh, you know, omnigender, yeah, I don't know. People, they think that changing gender is like buying an automobile. <laughs> that it's sort of a rational choice. And by the way, buying automobiles is not rational either, even though I'm an economist who's supposed to believe in it. No, the... the um, the thing about religion, which modern atheists or agnostics don't get, is that it's not about propositions. It's not about believing as many as six impossible things before breakfast, as, as the Red Queen said to Alice. It's not about virgin birth or the, what the host is doing, whether it's the body of Christ or not. It's about a way of life. It's about a journey. And the, con the kind of conversation that you and I were talking about a while ago, um, the kind of open conversation that asks these questions about what life means, what we're doing here, um, are uh, not not two plus two equals four sorts of questions. I think you, you would uh, uh, agree with that. So a commitment to a religious life, a life of inquiry, a life of asking what's behind it all. It's not a slam bang, oh, I know, it's such and such. And if you say the other, you're wrong. I, I just don't think that makes much sense. I don't think it's very mature. As you said earlier, a, a, a lot of what we think we know in the physical, biological sciences, certainly in the social sciences, is relatively absolute, as a famous economist once said, but it's not absolute. <laughs> we treat it as that 
that uh, E equals MC squared, which is go with that. Um, but Einstein's attitude was everything's provisional. It's an ongoing conversation. So mine is a very, um, mine is not Jerry Falwell, you know, baptism. It's, I'm a, I'm a progressive Episcopalian. And if you, and, and we're, we're the frozen chosen. <laughs> we believe in picking up the right fork at dinner. <laughs> is it, is it, is it consoling to you? No. It's not. No, it's not consoling. That's what my mom thinks. She's an agnostic, bordering on atheist. And her theory of religion is that it's consoling. That if you, you believe you'll get pie in the sky when you die, right? Um, in, term, in, the, in, in the words of the old uh, socialist song, um, then you're happy. No. Religion is actually at least serious religion. The religion of an intelligent person, a person who believes in science, um, as tries to have as deep as possible an understanding of society and, and literature and human culture, it's a challenge, because it's a challenge to live a Christian life to live a life of love and a life of forgiveness. You know, let's take as a contrast our the current occupant, Donald Trump. You know, a, a more irreligious person I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. He's a man filled with hatreds and anxieties. He's the one who's having a hard time. And, and his... But he's not, it's not because he's challenging him, his own beliefs. He's sunk in them. So, no, no, I, I don't think it's comforting at all. It, there are comforting aspects. The aspect of having a community. My, my little church is across the street from me here in Chicago, which is why I'm always late for church. Because there's always a chore to do. Oh, well, I'm only five minutes. It's only two minutes away. I, I can clean the toilet or something. <laughs> I, it, it's been um, it's been good for me, but the basic road you take is not one of comfort. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, think of the great religious figures: um, Abram, Muhammad. Uh, Buddha, Jesus, and all the saints. You know, these these people were agonizing. Right. You know, I guess the way I look at religion, I'm I'm an agnostic, and uh, uh, I you know I haven't found any theology that works for me, but I I I, I sort of feel this is related to what I said before about my postmodernism. I feel as though we are so ignorant of ourselves yeah. that, and, and life is hard. It is. That, um, and then you die. Yeah, and then you die. And that, and that we should, uh, you know, I've got my stories that work for me right now, but I might change my mind. And um, I sort of feel as though I, I've got to be tolerant of other people and, and recognize that, They've got their personal reason. I think it's absolutely crucial, but don't look down on them because of their personal reasons. Here, 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 here's a book that I suggest to you and the audience, a book by um, David Bentley Hart, David Bentley Hart, called The Experience of God. Mm -hmm. now, now, David is a Orthodox theologian. By Orthodox, I mean Eastern Orthodox. I think it's Greek Orthodox. He's not Greek, but anyway, he's a theologian. Mm -hmm. His book is very much along your lines. In, in some ways, it faces the same kind of questions that you're concerned with in your book. And it's a very deep, I mean, the first 50 pages just blow away the so-called new atheists, some of whom I, I know personally. 
um, and it shows that they're kind of silly. But then it goes on to establish the case for the existence of God, the case for connecting it with consciousness, and the case for connecting God and consciousness with joy, as he calls it. It's a deep, wonderful book. Thanks for the recommendation. I, I'm going to check it out. I'm I'm in this new phase of my life where I'm I'm open to anything. You're very welcome in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> my girlfriend, um, who was raised Jewish and is now kind of uh, I don't know. It's hard to describe her. She's sort of uh, she's very eclectic. A little bit of tarot, a little bit of astrology. Um, even though she's she's, I think. Uh, an atheist, she thinks I'm gonna I'm gonna return to Catholicism at some time in the future. <laughs> you know, it's the it's the faith of our ancestors. Right. Um, <laughs> anyway, Deirdre, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Uh, it, and uh, I, I hope we cross tracks again sometime in the future. I'm sure we will.